Motoring 2010 on TSN is brought to you by Quaker State, Real Durable Oil, and Michelin, a better way forward. With so many vehicles to choose from these days, it can be a blessing for consumers. It can also be overwhelming, and it can be frustrating for car manufacturers. I mean, how do you stand out among the crowd? Well, for many manufacturers, they like to push the envelope when it comes to design. But sometimes, well, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Two recent examples. Subaru, a great car, dull design. So the new Tribeca featured an aggressive front end. Well, it was a love-hate relationship. In fact, Subaru actually softened that look on future models. Up next, Acura. Bold new grille on the new TL. Again, the reaction was polarized, but Acura is committed to putting that new look on the entire lineup. Well, this week we're in Southern California where almost every car manufacturer has a design center. And we thought this week we would check out the new Acura lineup and also meet some of the people behind the new look. Acura has to distinguish itself in the marketplace. You know, the market is very crowded. There are many, many good brands of product now and quality by itself is, is no longer good enough. We have to distinguish ourselves and establish our place in the market. Acura designers came up with this new uh, design for the front and rear of our vehicles, which is now spread across the whole Acura lineup, and we will continue to evolve this design as we go forward. I think it's a long time coming for Acura. The brand's been in, in Canada now for 20 years, and I think for most of that, of that time, it really has suffered from a lack of identity, and the people at, at Acura know that. I think they're going in the right direction. Personally, I'm not overly taken with the new nose, or the beak as it's affectionately called, but they had to do something. They had to stake out their own piece of turf. There's an inherent risk any time you change a car, right? Everybody that loved the old one is not going to like the new one and vice versa. The problem is you just hope that you attract more people to the brand because of the new look than you lose because of the ones that don't like it. I just turned 29, actually. Um, I, I started working at Honda Acura in 2005 and I actually graduated from Art Center in 2005, so I came straight to Honda and uh, started on the ZDX as one of my first projects. I grew up in Northern California and uh, my mom and dad always had, you know, muscle cars and hot rods and stuff. So I would always kind of be following my dad around trying to help him with his cars. And at the same time, kind of parallel to that, I was always kind of into art classes and more artistic kind of creative things. So after I went to junior college for a couple years and I found out that you could do car design and it was the best of both worlds. So I figured might as well try it out. A lot of people end up starting off with more, you know, taillights or mirrors or something. And so for them to really let us do some blue sky project right from the get go was really exciting. And But we didn't even really know it was going to be, you know, a production project right away. The whole thing has been humbling and a complete honor. And it's, it's, I'm growing exponentially every year just because I'm learning so much. When it first came out, I absolutely hated it. Right now they've softened it. The ZDX, I really like the front end on that thing, strangely enough but the TL still a bit too much in my face. Any uh, change in direction for any design of any product is going to create that kind of uh, polarization. So of course we expected that, but the key is to create a consistent look for our Acura product as we go forward. Well, I think they can alienate people and they say themselves that they think it's polarizing and I guess if like half the people love it and half the people don't, then it's probably okay. If everyone likes something, then it's probably kind of bland. So if you can just get the, that, that group of people who like it to go and buy it, then, then your battle is pretty much won. We first started selling Acuras in 1987. We started with Integra. Uh, way back then uh, and we were selling you know the majority of our sales in those days were Integras and of course we had uh, the legend which we added afterwards today we have six totally different products so it's really evolved over the years it's very much like playing pokey you know if you don't have the right cards you can't play right now they're beginning to get the right cards in their hand they've got power they've got performance they've got a good all-wheel drive system they're known as being a tech savvy company one thing they didn't have was the look to say tech savvy. 
Do I like it? I like it more now than I did when I first saw it. I found it a bit shocking at first when I saw it, but sometimes that happens with new design. You just, you, it's, you're not, it's not familiar to you and you kind of recoil. Then you see it becomes more familiar to you and then, yeah, it's, it's oh, and look, it's an Acura. <laughs> I've been in the business for 35 years and I've never seen a marketplace like this. Uh, but what I can say is from the customer's point of view, there has never been a better time to buy a vehicle. So head to an Acura showroom. Absolutely. Three letters that could save your life or maybe take it. More later on Kenzie's Corner. When it debuted in Europe in 1976, it started the whole hot hatch phenomenon. On this edition of Test Drive, the Volkswagen Golf GTI. Since arriving in Canada in 1974, the Golf has been a perennial favorite. For 2010, the family grows in terms of its look and the models available. The sixth generation Golf includes the familiar three and five door models along with a new wagon. However, the version of choice has to be the latest GTI. As with its predecessor, this car is just plain fun, fun, and yet more fun. One of the things you notice about all of the Golfs is the fact they've dressed the interior up very nicely. Now when you go all the way up to the top of the line GTI, some fantastic seats that really do keep you planted when you play. You've also got all the right driver adjustments, tilt and telescopic steering wheel, you've got a height adjustable seat. Then you've got these paddle shifters. They are in the perfect position, even as you turn off center, they remain at your fingertips. Then there's some nice touches. Touch sensitive screen, a very loud and proud audio system. It all comes together in a manner that is very rich and classy indeed. Lift the hood and you'll find a big part of the reason the GTI is so much fun. A two liter turbocharged four that pushes 200 horsepower and more importantly, 207 pound feet of torque. The fact the torque turns up for work at just 1700 RPM means there is absolutely no turbo lag whatsoever. Stand on the gas and the car chirps the front tires until the traction nanny steps to the fore. The engine's lively work ethic also brings some solid performance numbers. The GTI scampers to 100k in 6.7 seconds and it accomplishes the more important passing move in just 4.6 seconds. From the outside, the GTI actually looks rather cramped. However, when you get into the back seat, there's a deceptive amount of room. Plenty of headroom and plenty of knee room. Now, the knee room comes courtesy of the 2578 millimeter wheelbase. As for width, well, you only want to put two people back here because the person that's stuck here, well, they got nowhere to put their feet. While the GTI is offered with a six-speed manual box, it's the twin-clutch DSG gearbox that's a must. Not only are the shifts blindingly fast, it has the uncanny knack of anticipating what the driver is about to do. Pull back on one of the paddles, and it brings the wanted engine braking as it rev matches on the way down. The bonus is that this gearbox also brings the mechanical efficiency of the manual, along with better fuel economy and the ease of operation of an automatic. Of course, the fact the powertrain sounds the part underscores the GTI's playful nature. One of the key advantages to the GTI is the hatchback versatility it brings to the party. Now with the privacy cover out of the way, you've got about 14 and a half cubic feet of cargo space. Fold the rear seats flat, and that number grows to 54 cubic feet. There's also some nice touches. First of all, there's a ski pass-through built into the larger half of the rear seat. That allows you to carry four people and their skis inside the vehicle. The other things, 12-volt outlet and some handy storage space beneath the floor. 
The final part of the GTI's fun quotient comes from the manner in which it blazes a trail through a fast corner. Not only do the front struts and multiple rear links banish body roll, the setup manages to absorb all but the biggest road imperfection without beating up the riders. Factor in the GTI's large 225-45R17 tyres, speed sensitive steering and powerful brakes, and the Golf GTI dances a mighty fine dance whenever the driver demands. Pylons? What pylons? This latest GTI will perpetuate the hot hatch phenomenon. This thing has got a very nice interior, a ton of versatility, it handles exceptionally well, and it's got a delightful powertrain that actually sounds the part. The bottom line? This car is all about rocket science. Remember this guy? Just another day in the outback. Hogan. Australian actor Paul Hogan, star of the movie Crocodile Dundee. Well, in 1995, Hogan was the man Subaru picked to introduce the brand new Outback, since Paul is from the Outback. Those marketing guys are pretty clever, aren't they? It was really first called the Legacy Outback, since it was a legacy wagon with some added cladding and suspension. Either way, it proved to be a big success. And now we have the new and improved Outback in our long-term fleet. The Subaru likes to brag that it created the crossover segment with this vehicle 15 years ago. The 2010 model has been restyled. It's actually taller and wider, but two inches shorter. Yet there's plenty of cargo space and it actually feels roomier than its predecessor because of the added width and height. Our test model comes with a 2.5 liter four with 170 horsepower, but if you want more power, you can always spend more money and offer the 3.66 with 256 horses. On our next update, a pet peeve. Make sure you check out the Motoring website at motoringtv.com. You can watch any program you may have missed. In fact, how about a trip down memory lane and see what we were driving as far back as 1988. Check out our blog, our photo gallery, and much more. It's all there at motoringtv.com. What you learn is that people still don't know exactly what an electric vehicle is and they don't know how an electric vehicle feels. What we want to achieve at the end that people get into the vault, get a drive experience and at the end say, oh I can, I can get all, everything I had with conventional technology but I can save fuel at the same time, can be environmentally friendly and have the old fun to drive and get my personal mobility without sacrifice. He said that the goal of this vehicle was to you know, determine whether or not this car felt like a science project or felt like something you had to get used to. Uh, and I think, you know, my first impressions, just hopping out of it, a couple loops around the tech center here, feels like a normal car. You know, when the new TL was first introduced, most of the reaction concerned that new bold front end. But other comments were, where is the manual transmission? Well, one year later, the new TL now has a six-speed manual. And believe me, it gives this vehicle a new personality, one I think you're going to like. All right, now let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Well, what is this, three or four weeks now in a row where Brad's down in Southern California basking in the sun. And we're up here in the frozen tundra north of the 49, kicking snow around. By the way, Brad, I agree with you. Sporty car like the Acura begs to have a six-speed manual tranny. Much more fun to drive. But up here in the frozen tundra, all-wheel drive is the thing to have for about six months of the year for many of us. So I want to talk about the all-wheel drive system in the 2010 Dodge Journey. The vehicle you're looking at is the all-wheel drive version of the Dodge Journey. This one it has the RT package, which gives you the 3.5 liter V6 engine. Now the base model Journey gets a 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine, and it's a front-wheel drive vehicle. So adding the all-wheel drive package and the bigger engine transforms this vehicle into a totally different drive. Now the neat thing about the Journey all-wheel drive system is that it has an electronically controlled coupling in the driveline. And that differs from a lot of other all-wheel drive vehicles 
that use either a viscous coupling in the drive line or a gear rotor system. Both those systems require some degree of wheel slip before they engage. With the Journey system, they're able to dial in the all-wheel drive based on some operator parameters that don't necessarily require wheel slip, ice, snow, or a low traction situation. Perfect example, what they've done is between 40 and 105K, if you're turning and accelerating, they divert power to the rear wheels to make the vehicle handle a little bit more neutral and corner better. Obviously, if you're trying to corner hard and put a lot of power through the front wheels of a front wheel drive vehicle, you tend to use up the front tires and the vehicle wants to push wide in a turn. By bringing in the all wheel drive system, it's more neutral and it handles better. Now when you get on ice and snow, you get the advantage of fantastic traction, better control, and just a safer drive all around. I had a chance to drive this journey during the first couple of uh, early winter snowstorms. Drove around my subdivision looking for those unplowed roads. Got a little bit crazy with the throttle, tried to get it loose, and believe me, it's pretty hard to get this thing out of shape no matter how crazy you get with the throttle. And that's probably the one and only drawback to an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive vehicle. You've got to sort of temper your enthusiasm because sooner or later you have to get it woed down and stop. And I think Jim Kenzie had a, a term for this years ago, and I guess pertaining to four-wheel drive trucks, and he said, you just get stuck further from home or crash at higher speed. We don't want to do that, so you got to temper that enthusiasm, keep the speed down, and just go with that confidence that you get from driving an all-wheel drive vehicle. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2010. Auto journalists were in for a real treat recently at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Not only was former Saab rally great Eric Carlson in town, but he also brought along some very talented drivers. The Saab performance team is comprised of men who work in the technical division of Saab in Sweden. This was their first opportunity in North America to demonstrate that when a driver and machine become one, the results can be phenomenal. Yeah, this team started up at uh, 87 for a 50 years anniversary and uh, we're using this uh, 900 turbo three-door sedan and that's uh, actually quite standard. We have done nothing but uh, increase the tire pressure. That's all we do. To start up with a snake that we call it. I think it's uh, showing how smooth you can go and narrow to the other car, you know, and uh, still have full control. You're the leader, every, all the pressure's on you? Yeah, all well, the pressure is on me, you can say that, yeah. But that's, I don't know if, if it's easier to be in the front or in the, in the back, you know, they had to increase the speed a little bit more and when you do this turning and so on, but in front we have to, to keep the speed down to keep them steady back there. There are people called stunt drivers but do you consider yourself stunt drivers or? No, we are not stunt drivers. We are common guys who have done a lot of driving. I think we are quite experienced drivers, all of us, because we have done a lot of rally driving back home in, in Sweden and other countries in Europe. I think we have been rally driving for 10, 15 years, all of us. So we, have the, we have the experience to, to drive a car on slippery roads, and that we use on the asphalt. The team effort, a chemistry, how important is that among the team? I think it's quite important, well, otherwise it won't work. Everyone has to be on top of everything. You know. And we all love to drive cars and that's, that's the main thing I think. Closed captioning of Motoring 2010 is brought to you by the most fuel-efficient crossover on the highway, the all-new Chevy Equinox. GPS, Global Positioning Satellite System, better known as Satellite Navigation or SatNav. It's one of the great inventions of the recent decade. Now, the early systems were a lot of fun because, frankly, they weren't very quick. 
you make a turn or two and you poor system and get all confused. And we always tried to figure out how long will it take to take Doris of the dashboard to say, if possible, please make a legal U-turn. But the new systems are a lot better, and frankly, I don't know how we got along without them. I actually have driven in Paris using maps. I don't know how I did it. With GPS, you plug in where you want to go, and you go there. Now, there are a few problems there. First of all, you still have to drive the car. There was a case, I believe it was in Scotland, where a chap was driving along a little road and the sat-nav told him, turn left. Well, he turned left and went down a cliff. Well, come on, buddy, you still gotta watch where you're going. And there was a more recent situation where a couple of elderly people were following the sat-nav system and they went down a road where there was a big sign saying, road not maintained in winter. Well, guess what? They got stuck and only through a minor miracle were they found in time before they actually died. So you still have to drive your car. Now there's an interesting situation coming up with GPS. A lot of cars have them as options and they're pretty expensive options. But you can also buy a GPS system from a TomTom -Tom or a Garmin for a couple of hundred bucks. Just plug it into your cigarette lighter. It's a lot cheaper. One of the drawbacks, of course, is that it's not tied into your car's ignition system. Most of the in-car systems don't allow you to plug in a destination while the car's moving on the not unreasonable assumption that maybe you should be paying attention to your driving instead of working the sat-nav with the tom-toms or the garments, no problem. But the long-term situation, it's a bit of a problem for both the suppliers of individual systems and those ones in the cars. If you got an iPhone, who needs a sat-nav? I'm Jim Kenzie. It wasn't that long ago I'd go to car shows and people would say to me, I'm not even going near the imports, I only buy domestic. Well, that line between imports and domestics is getting narrower every year and Acura is a good example. 50% of all Acuras sold in this country are built in Alliston, Ontario. 80% of Acuras sold in Canada are actually built in North America. So there you go. And before we go, remember our Car of the Year one hour special is quickly approaching. So go to motoringtv.com and cast your vote on our nominees and you might even win some really cool swag. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. If you're going to introduce a vehicle anywhere in North America, Detroit's really the place you want to be. And if you're an importer trying to uh, establish your, your bona fides as a, as a North American manufacturer, this is a good place to do that because it positions you as actually a North American manufacturer uh, and supplier, not just uh, another importer duking it out for market share. Motoring 2010 on TSN has been brought to you by Quaker State, real durable oil, and Michelin, a better way forward. <laughs>